and welcome to the Bay Area Independent Filmmakers. I'm your host, Connie Jo Seacrest. Today on the show, we are talking with the author, Marty Brownstein, who brings us a true story of rescue with his book, Two Amongst the Righteous Few, a story of courage in the Holocaust. It's a story of a young married Christian couple in the Netherlands named Franz and Mien Weinacher. In a time plagued by hate, fear, death, and destruction, they will get involved when most won't and save the lives of over two dozen Jews from certain death. Thanks for joining me today, Marty. How are you doing today, Marty? Very good. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming in. And um, where are you originally from, Marty? I'm originally from the Chicago area. Okay. Many moons ago, and like many, I transplanted out to the Bay Area now over 25 years ago. Great. Great. Awesome. And how do you like the Bay Area? Uh, the winters are much nicer. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. Now, the traffic is caught up to as bad as the Chicago area, if not Los Angeles today, but the Bay Area and San Francisco are wonderful places to be. Great. And um, so this book, it's, it's very different from all the other books that you've written in the past. Definitely. What? How did you come about this, this story? It's a story I actually stumbled into by accident on a trip to the Netherlands in May of 2009. Mm -hmm. So prior to that in my life, if I had heard the name Franz and Mean Weinacher, the heroes of the story, it never stuck. And my wife had some curiosities. She's originally from the Netherlands, and they immigrated when she was near 14 to Los Angeles. And so some curiosity is we did this special trip in the Netherlands. We went for six weeks, and I had never mm -hmm. been prior. She hadn't been for 25 years. Nobody left in terms of friends or family. And we're having a wonderful time, and about two-thirds of the way into this trip in May of 2009, she has some curiosity. She wants to go into this area of southeastern Netherlands. And if she could find the Weinachers, Franz and Mien aren't alive, but their children are. Mm -hmm. she, she's interested, but not, has had no contact. Who knows if we're going to be able to do that anyway. And I'm just kind of tagging along. Yeah. So it's uh, one thing led to another. We come into the area, and actually I write about this in the first chapter of the book. We come into the area to the big small town of the area called Robinstein. Mm -hmm. And about what I'm going to roll out as I explain what happened, people often say serendipity is what happened. Because we go in there, and it's a nice little historic little small town. It's a pleasant day, not rainy, not cold, as you may often get there, 75 or something. And we're going to go have a cup of coffee, a nice afternoon to relax. And she looks over across the street and says, look, a tourist information office. You don't usually see those in the yeah. little towns. You see them in the big cities. So okay. she goes into the office, and she can still speak Dutch fluent enough. And we may have been the only traffic to visit that little tourist information office that whole day. So she goes in, and she starts talking to them. And she says, you know, there used to be this town, Deden, I know somewhere near here. And there was a big church as kind of a landmark next to a home that once belonged to Franz Weinacher. Is that church still around? And they perked up. And I'm just watching this, but I could see them perked up when mm -hmm. she said the name. If you're older in that area, you know who that is. He's actually a local hero. And they not only explained to her that that church is still there, but the house is still there next to it. And one of the Weinacher's sons still lives in that particular house. Ah. Here's how you would get there. Yeah. So off we go down the road a few minutes later. It's about a 10-minute drive. We're into the town of Deden. We park next to that church. Serendipity continues because there's the house. And we're walking up the long driveway, and you actually see in the house in the front part, about a foot in size, the word shalom. Okay. And as the serendipity continues, not only does one of the Weinacher sons still live in the house, he's home. If he's not home, none of this happens. Yeah. Not only is he home, he's sitting in the front yard with his wife and somebody else they were just visiting with. And my wife recognizes there's three Weinacher sons and two daughters. She's not sure which of the sons, but she knows it's one of them. He has that look. And they remember her by more her Dutch nickname. My wife's name is Leah. Mm -hmm. Inika is her Dutch nickname. So she just runs up, reaches out her hand, says, hello, I'm Inika Bars. Whoa! He got so excited. Yeah. And I'm just kind of watching this, and they don't speak really any English. And I get introduced, and his wife is on the phone. She's all excited, calling around. I'm kind of just kind of watching what's going on. And then I got blown away because he runs into the house, and he comes out with this blown-up picture. And he said, my wife and I, this is the translation of it, but I almost didn't need a translator, we went to Yad Vashem last year. Now, I know what that is, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, Israel. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture of the plaque of my parents 
in the avenue of the righteous. Now, I knew what that meant. You don't get that for showing up. Something heroic happened here. That's a very special honor called righteous among the nations for the Mm non-Jews who risk their lives to try to save the lives of Jews during the Holocaust. So that's the beginning spark of what got me into the, then I want to discover the story more and build upon it. Wow, amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing what you can find when you just go on a on yes, a vacation. On a scavenger hunt. On a scavenger essence. hunt. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. And um, now, one of the people that got saved was a married couple, and they they were pregnant. Yes. yes how yes. how is that? How is that personal connection yeah, with you yes, and, and you know, the book? I have a very meaningful personal connection to the story and its heroes. And mm-hmm. when I do storytelling presentations. I save that to the end because most of the time the audience has not read the book before. So yeah. if you're asking me to reveal that now, giving away my special secrets here, <laughs> you're keep it between yourself and your audience here. And that was partly why we were there yeah. in the curiosity. Because uh, Franz and me started out by taking in three Jewish refugee children, not knowing that they're going to get fully involved in this and not necessarily understanding the risk and dangers initially. Mm-hmm. And then it built from there. Well, the first day, adults they took into hiding into their own house was this young married couple, similar in age to them, who she was already pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that's a near impossible situation to deal with. The Netherlands was under Nazi Germany's brutal occupation. Yeah, yeah. And they couldn't take her then to the local hospital and have the birth done there. So, huge dilemma. They could have even sent her away to someone else to handle it. Mm -hmm. They decided to deal with it, and they performed a miracle. They got the baby born and kept her safe even claimed her as their own child, registered under false name, mm-hmm. so she could be a small you know, baby with their small children rather than a baby in hiding to even make this work even further. And now a little over eight years ago, I married that baby. <laughs> My wife was saved by this couple. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, it is. That is amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing story. Yes. Um, making me tear up already. <laughs> now, Franz and Mean have already passed away. Yes. Um, they have five kids. Yes. And you kind of worked worked with these kids in order to to make the book, the you know, in order to research and make the book. Yeah. How how was it with with talking with them and, yeah, and, and I'll researching? Explain how that, that worked. Uh, mm-hmm. On that initial accidental visit. Yeah. One of the things that we got told in that tourist information office, they gave my wife an email address. And they said, there's some kind of self-published Dutch book about what Franz did during the war. You'd be interested in finding out because she ex- explained why she was interested in getting to the house. Okay. So when we then find, and there's Franz Jr. there, and he's all excited to see her and his wife is calling around in the book. I wrote the Dutch was flying, the phone calls were flying. Uh, the other siblings ex- were not home except one was. Irene, the youngest, and she's born right after the war. The other four were alive during the war. She's the keeper of the self-published Dutch book, and she gave it to us. Okay. And so during the course of, and in fact, they invite us to come back. A couple days later, we'll come back, and then there'll be a happy reunion with my wife with all five of the siblings. They all came when they heard she was in town. But between the Monday and Wednesday, my wife read the book out loud and because she's reading and translating as she goes. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle with pieces missing. But you get the gist of the story of the amazing work that Franz and Mean did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When we go home that summer, not that I know I'm going to do a book at this point, but I am certainly stimulated by the story, she writes out the raw translation and gives it to me. And says, see what you can do with this. <laughs> it's like an extra credit project when you're in school. Yeah. And so I start over time trying to organize it, historical research, we realize we still need more clarity, so we need to go back to the family. And even on that visit, we even got more, especially from Nellie. She becomes our point person for all of the five children uh-huh. that helped us with that. And so we end up uh, some months later doing a long-distance phone call with Nellie, her daughter who can speak English, and my wife. So there's translations going on. We gave questions in advance. And she was able to give us more insight on some of the things that we were reading about who's there and what's going on. and other things around it. Now, some of the questions, her answer was this. I don't know, ask Freitje. Freitje, false name, yeah. was the first person they took into hiding. Her real name, Shula. Shula okay. Schwartz today. And here's the serendipity, because they said, most of the people my parents 
helped are no longer alive. Yeah. But they're still in touch with Freitje. They more remember her by that name. She was a teenager, 14, when the first one they took into hiding. As the serendipity continues in the whole development of this, that call we had with Nellie, she'd given us her address. We ended up riding to Shulo. We already had a trip set shortly after this call with Nellie to Israel. Mm -hmm. Shula Schwartz lives in Haifa, Israel. So in late oh. April 2010, we saw her in person. Wow. We only spent an evening with her. We spent three days. Nice. She wouldn't let us go for all the best reasons. <laughs> and she could even give us more of a picture and had more memories. Mm -hmm. And had never fully talked about it mm -hmm. than till now with us. And so that, that, that helped. The other thing that I think was a turning point for us in this, in terms of, how am I going to try to make it into a book? My last question to Nellie in the interview we had with her long distance was if we wanted to take that self-published Dutch book and build upon it and incorporate it into a book and get it published in the United States, would you support that? Now, she said, no, I respect that. I'm yeah. done. Her answer was this. I would be honored. Okay. How do you turn away at that point? Yeah. <laughs> and so that was about a year and a half in the making and eventually then finding a publisher and out we go, you know, people say, is it self-published? No, it's a real publisher. There's many out there. And we found one that we found actually a few that were interested, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is very unusual. Yeah. So this is the one we went with right now and away we go. And that was there. But Nellie was, and Nellie just briefly, as far as we know, talked to the others and they all supported it and signed off and yes, please do it. Mm -hmm. And they all have the book today themselves. Very In fact, cool. what was neat too, just as a little postscript to this, we, after the book initially came out and we sent to both Shula yeah. And we sent to the five Vinocker children. Nellie's daughter, who lives right with her, who can speak English, she wrote to us. And she said, thank you for doing this. You know, she was kind of speaking on behalf of her mother. Thank you for doing this. Much better story. Well, much better written than that little self-published Dutch book. Yeah. And thank you for giving us a legacy that we can pass on to the next generations of our family. Shortly after, around the same time, I get, thank goodness for Skype, and we're still in touch with Shula via Skype, and I get a call. Now, I usually I don't use Skype often, and most of the time I'm calling out on it if I'm out of town calling long distance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have this consulting business, and I had a client call I was on about wrapping up, and then this ring is coming out of my computer. What is that? I'm thinking, from, well, oh, it's Skype. You know, wrap up the call and quickly, you know, hit the button to... And it's Shula Schwartz coming, calling me from Haifa, Israel. And she says, Marty, I just got done reading your book. She can speak English. What a great job you did with that story. Well, that made, of course, my day because the yeah. people who most we did this for most appreciated it. Yeah, and that was my next question, actually, is how, how they reacted to, yeah. to reading the story after, after you produced yes. it. Yeah, and for the Vinockers, yeah. you know, they're very proud of their parents. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is the reminder now. We now, now people in the United States are getting to know about yeah. their parents. Yeah, it's becoming a part of history. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Which is great. It's wonderful. And um, if you were put in the same situation as, as Franz and Mean, like, how would, what would you do? Yeah, yes. I get that question periodically from yeah. audiences. And even when we, more so even when we go into schools, where I don't do my storytelling presentation, I will, we get the right teacher, the students have read the book. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I lead discussion. We've had kids ask us that, even more than adults sometimes. And here's how I answer that. I throw it back on them. What mm -hmm. would you have done? Because I want them to think about that. In audiences, yeah. we also, in my opening, we, we get them to think about it. There's no right answer to the question. Who knows? Luckily, we're not in those situations of life and death because the risks were tremendous. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. get caught doing this. The Nazis didn't give you warnings or tickets. You're gone to the concentration camp. Death awaits you. Yeah. So who knows? But I answer it this way, too. And this is when I want people, and I'm glad if people are thinking about it and thinking about themselves, great. That's what I'm hoping for. Character. People who have the character to care about others and help, I hope I have a little bit of it. Yeah. I hope I'm instilling it in others. Those are the ones that likely would have helped, or at least today will help others in simple ways. Mm -hmm. That is not common, unfortunately, that people have that sense of character like that. That's very true, especially in these days. That's right. Especially That's in these right. days. Awesome. Um, now let's get into 
adapting this you uh, you're adapting the story into a screenplay yes. into a film yes let's get into the to the journey of, of making that possible yes. what are the steps that you yes. have taken so far in order to good question push that out there and i'll even if i can give a little background to that mm -hmm. first i mean this is in essence an unexpected journey yeah so the the journey once the you know the first journey was developing the story that i never expected to do yeah next phase of the journey which is now four years into it has been sharing the story with audiences. Mm -hmm. Not only in the Bay Area where we live here, and I'm based, is I've been to like 10 other cities with trips. Over 360 events in less than four years now of large to small audiences sharing the story. What's come up periodically in many of those audiences over the last few years is this. Have you ever thought about getting this made into a movie? Yeah. Easier said than done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so last year was the beginning of trying to seek some resources who could help do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a rocky road. Now, if you can find people who will be happy to take fees and consulting and will help you get it done, but not able to. The success of last year, at least, was a screenplay has now been written. So okay. the book has been adapted into a screenplay. At the start of this year, 2015, which is only a couple months ago here, I got introduced to somebody who's kind of up and coming with his filmmaking company. His name is Christopher Broughton of Moxie Motion Pictures. Okay. He himself has been in the industry for 25 plus years as an actor, a writer, director, producer of music, TV, film. He's, got, he's had a hit TV show in South Korea. He has a studio in China, relationships internationally. Uh, recently, when I saw him in Los Angeles, where he's based, we had a meeting at Sony. He's got close ties, the key executive there. He's right. doing things there. He thinks he's going to get them behind us. So we're now at the process of at least starting to finally go forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have somebody, you know, he's working the investors. Otherwise, he probably would be here with us right now today. Yeah. But he's down in L.A. courting investors. He's got some agreements starting, others that he's going after. So, And his his view is... You get the financing, and he wants it as an independent film versus a studio film, mm -hmm. studio support distribution. That's where we're going to be able to make the story as we need to be made. So that's kind of where the journey is. And then I've had, you know, occasional, I mean, you know Tony Suddy mm -hmm. has kind of been like a film consultant. Yes. And trying to leverage last year, she tried to introduce me to some people. None of those came to pass. One had potential. Just didn't work out right. Again, wanted to charge a lot of fees to help. So... But she this year is again wanted to engage again to help and now is looking to see if she can help contact some people she knows that might be investors, which is what we need. So that's kind of where it's evolved. Mm -hmm. Much more I can say today, now it's on a trajectory to go forward. More steps to climb. Yes. At least we're climbing in the right direction. Good, good. And I, I'm so supportive of, of this of this climb and this journey that you guys are taking in the independent film. Thank you. Um, making this an independent film is, yeah, is yes. great. And we hope it gets to be out there. One of the things that uh, Christopher and others will often say when they, they read the book and they know mm -hmm. the story, and he knows it well, one of the things that why he, I think, will be the right answer, he recognized right, he said, you have more than a Holocaust story. Yes. It's a story with great values, lessons, it's love. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want that to all come out in this film. And yeah. he says, I don't want to be making films, and I don't. He said that our, you know, there's so much garbage out there today. I want films that you can bring your family to, films that people get good lessons for. We got the story. Films that, that touch you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he walks around in Sony because he's well connected there now, and he says, you guys need a hit. I got one coming. <laughs> so he's a bold, brash guy at times, too. Very awesome. Very mm -hmm. good. I'm looking forward to it. And where could uh, where could people hear more about this story and, and, and get your book? Yes, they can go onto my website, okay. www.martyabrownstein.com. And Brownstein is B-R-O-U-N-S-T-E-I-N. Okay. And they'll see we have some more speaking engagements still coming this spring. Mm -hmm. And they can certainly then order the book through the website as well. And so please connect in the contact information is there they want to talk to me about coming to speak to their organization i've been in a variety of venues sharing the story there's not just one niche yeah from faith-based places to workplaces libraries bookstores people's homes social service organizations schools universities etc so the story fits everywhere mm -hmm. that's the neat thing about it here's a flavor of what audience hear and experience when marty delivers his engaging storytelling presentation about franz and mean weinacker after the war broke out 
Franz took a leave of absence from his job at the mill. He thought he could make a little bit more money by getting meat and eggs from farmers in the countryside near where he lives, and then he travels two hours to the west on the train to Amsterdam, the capital city of the Hague, and he's selling food to people in the cities. The food he's selling, pretty scarce. The Germans have taken a lot of it away and shipped it off to Germany. This business he's doing, black market business, not legal. You're supposed to have food ration cards for most of your food supplies, so keep it under the table, don't get caught. And he's a pretty good salesman doing it. Spring 1943, Franz was on one of these business trips in Amsterdam. And he calls upon this Dr. Queens he's done business with before. Before he leaves the meeting with the doctor, the doctor turns him and says, would you be willing to help? And the doctor explains. See, we've got this young girl hiding here in the city of Amsterdam. We'd love to get her out to the countryside where you live. Uh, what's your town again? Franz says, Deden. Yes, let's say you take her out to Deden for three weeks. That way she'd get a little better fresh air and a little better food. Oh, and by the way, she's Jewish. So would you be willing to help? And this was Franz's response. Okay. <laughs> Not exactly knowing what he's getting into, but he's a helpful guy. You've asked for something, so sure, I'll help. <laughs> And before the night is out, he's going to meet this young girl. He only knows her by her false Dutch identity name, Freitje. You don't sneak somebody out of the cities where the German presence is the strongest and the Dutch Nazis are around. You don't do that during the day, not even early evening. You don't get out till late at night. Franz will finally sneak Freitje out of Amsterdam and finally make it home to Dean around midnight. There were no cell phones in those days. <laughs> so when he's not home by supper time, what's his wife mean feeling? Yeah, she's very worried. That's right. Did my husband get caught doing this black market business? Is he arrested sitting in jail somewhere? I'm not sleeping tonight. And then finally, around midnight, he shows up unexpectedly with this young girl. And he explains briefly to his wife, uh, uh, we're going to have this young girl stay with us here for three weeks. And this was Mean's response. Well, it's late. Let's get her to bed. <laughs> he dodged a bullet there. <laughs> and a new business has just begun for Franz and Mean Weinacher. Let me tell you about Frasier briefly. She was not Dutch. She was a German Jewish girl. She and her siblings, she was one of six, are able to get out of Germany at the end of 1938. Someone had mentioned earlier, Kristallnacht. Shortly after that, that massive rampage and riot in Germany and Austria against Jews. After that was over, the Dutch government was willing to let in, the term for it was, a few thousand unaccompanied children, not families, as long as Dutch Jewish families would take care of them. Well, Frazier and her siblings then make it out, get placed within homes of Dutch Jewish families in Amsterdam and life will go on, but they will never see their parents again. And she goes to school, she learns Dutch right away, her siblings don't live far away, so they see each other fairly often. She makes new friends, in fact, she'd play with kids right down the block from her. In fact, one girl that she would play with among a group of others sometimes was a girl similar in age to her. Also of German Jewish background, but that girl and her family got out of, Ger of Germany early 1930s when a whole family had a better chance to do that, made a nice life for themselves in Amsterdam. But the problem for this family and others like them, when the occupation got bad, if you tried to go into hiding and stay in the major cities, especially like Amsterdam, your chances of surviving the war, slim. They got caught, among others. This was a girl named Anne Frank. Well, as you might imagine, Freitje will stay actually a little longer than three weeks. In fact, after being there for a week, Mean comes to Franz one day and says, you know, I've been talking to Freitje. You know what I think I figured out? I think she's Jewish. Did you know that? <laughs> Franz said, yeah, I knew. <laughs> well, she's got a younger brother still hiding in Amsterdam. Go get him. And out on the train, they'll go and they're going to sneak out her younger brother and they're going to call him Fritzsche, not his real name. And a short time after that, through these various acquaintances, former teachers in Amsterdam, they come out in the train, on the train to this area with a girl of 17 who happens to be Jewish. And they bring her to the home of Franz and Meade say, sure, bring her in. And now there's three Jewish children refugees in their home with their four small children. Do they recognize what they've gotten into? Not fully yet. It's illegal. And we already talked earlier, consequence is deadly. But they're going to go on anyway. And then comes the pivotal moment. Stranger shows up on Franz's doorstep one day. Starts talking to him right away. And he won't say what his real name is. He only goes by this code name, Long John. And initially, as he's talking to Franz, he's making him very nervous because this Long John fellow seems to know that Franz Weinacher has three Jewish refugee children in his own home. And Franz is wondering, how does this guy know this? Is he a spy? Is he with the police to come arrest me, Franz is wondering? And then this Long John fellow says this, you could be of help to us.
Yeah, sit in. It is a wonderful story. It's a very wonderful story. As I now know. As yes. I now know. Yes. Great, great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Marty. My pleasure. And I look forward to speaking more about you, about this journey, about making your making this a film, making this an independent film. And uh, like he said, people, if you if you're interested in his book, go to martyabrownstein.com, and it's Two Among the Righteous Few. And I very, very highly encourage you to read this book. Thank you very much. <laughs>